Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, we are talking about uh, team building in China. Okay, hold on. Let's see. All right, today we're going to be talking about team building in China. Uh, we're obviously going to be talking about the cross-cultural context of teamwork in China. And we're going to do something a little bit different today. So instead of really just going through misperceptions and greatest challenges, what we're going to do today is we're going to contrast the backgrounds of someone like me who was born and raised in the United States and somebody that I might be trying to work together with in China and how that uh, difference in the background of how we were raised would affect how we view teamwork. All right, we're also going to do a case study and then, of course, always get into the killer tips and the question and answer session. So we always talk about um, Guanxi as the most important aspect of doing business in China. And there's a lot of things that we've talked about in the previous webinars that will affect your ability to develop real Guanxi relationships and how that may affect uh, how that may affect the outcomes and the perceptions that you are able to achieve. Okay, today we're going to focus on a concept that you've all heard about, but uh, you may not really understand how it might apply to something like teamwork, and that's the philosophy of Confucianism. So, as you all know, uh, Confucius um, really focused on how do you create social harmony in a society that has different class structures. So basically Confucianism is based on a system of hierarchy where um, that is how social order is maintained. And I'm gonna try to discuss how that type of mindset affects how people view teamwork and how that might be different than uh, say in a Western context. All right, um, again, we're doing all of this because we wanna try to understand how we can better understand two things. Number one is how we are perceived by other people. And number two, what other people think and how they feel, which we call the essential soft skills that matter. And in the concept of cross-cultural performance mastery, we really wanna focus on the things that we can adjust about ourselves. And this is what we call our AMA values, our attitude, mindset, and approach. And that is basically what influences how we are perceived by other people, okay? And how we are perceived by other people, especially when you're talking about teamwork, will ultimately affect outcomes. And as you can see, the essential soft skills are basically what enables us to have insights into number one, how we are perceived, and so how we may wanna adjust our attitude, mindset, and approach. But another is how other people feel about what our attitude, mindset, and approach might be, and how those perceptions may affect outcomes. Okay, so today's main topic is how do you foster real teamwork in China? So it, teamwork is a very, kind of loosely used term and everybody talks about how important teamwork is. And when you go to a cross-cultural environment and if you're non-Chinese and you go into China and you start preaching teamwork, I think it's really important to understand how the people in China actually view teamwork and why. Okay, so uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is there's always, we're talking about context and we wanna contrast different things. So there's always a difference between how Chinese people view different terms that we throw around. So we may use words like partnering and teamwork. We may use those interchangeably, but in China, when it's translated, partnering and teamwork actually mean something different, okay? So let's talk about why Chinese, how they think about partnering and why they're interested in partnering. So uh, basically for partnering, a lot of times Chinese want to access intellectual property or access know-how, okay? It's also about face or prestige when you're associated sometimes at the individual level, when you're associated with an American or European, 
but sometimes it's at the company level where you're associated with like a with a BMW or an Apple or a Microsoft. So that's part of the reasons why people want to partner. And of course, money is a big aspect of why people in China want to partner. And also, this is something that's often overlooked is at an individual level when Chinese are developing partnerships at the company level and individuals have to interact. A lot of times, and I've experienced this many, many times, is that Chinese are often looking for a bridge for their children to study overseas or to move overseas or for them and their families to actually get green cards or permanent residencies in other countries. People with wealth and connections in China it's not a secret that often they are investing overseas and they're trying to establish residency overseas, especially for their children, okay? Now for teamwork. Now I'm gonna get into the context of how we as Americans view teamwork, but for Chinese, the way that I would view teamwork is really a foreign concept to people in China. And when we use words like synergy, that really doesn't have any emotional meaning to people in China. And I'm gonna explain why in the next slide. So teamwork in China is really more like project-based coordination, okay? That's how Chinese people really view teamwork. It's just how do we coordinate? And a lot of times in, in companies, there's a project manager that, that, that drives when people are supposed to do what. But it's not really teamwork in the sense that uh, we're all really striving for the same outcome or the same goal, okay? In China, there's a lot of uh, what we call an individual contributor mentality. And this is for people who are in positions of leadership, people who manage other people, people who are project managers. They cannot get away from the individual contributor mentality and in the next slide, I'm really going to talk about why that is so you can understand in context sometimes why Chinese people uh, behave the way they behave. And another thing to really understand is because of the whole um, system of face and mianzi, uh, Chinese people don't really like constructive feedback. In fact, uh, almost any feedback is not at an emotional level it doesn't feel like it's constructed, it, it feels negative. And uh, Chinese people have a tendency to react negatively to even constructive feedback. Um, you know, maybe the people who are more trained to how Westerners talk and how they work and how they behave, maybe they will put on a face and be courteous, but at an emotional level, uh, constructive feedback is not something that they really value. And I think the main thing is, is when you want to try to understand, uh, this may seem like a contradiction because when we talk about China as a country and China as a society, we really talk about that it's a very kind of collectivist culture, very nationalistic, very patriotic. And the distinction that we really have to make is that collectivism is not the same as team orientation as we would talk about it uh, in my case, in, in America, okay? So here's where we're gonna really contrast uh, why Chinese view teamwork different than somebody like me. So this is my upbringing, my upbringing versus uh, somebody in China that I might partner with, okay? And, and my information comes from not only my spouse or my wife who is Chinese, but a lot of friends that I have really deep connections with who are Chinese. And we would talk about the environment in which they were raised and how that has shaped their worldview and their perspective. So growing up in the United States, and you can see that's actually over a picture of me, uh, I started playing team sports since age six. So from age six to age 16, which are basically my most formative years, I played baseball, which is a team sport, basketball, soccer, and football. And if you know anything about team sports, a lot of times you make sacrifices for the team. In fact, 
literally in baseball, there's a term called sacrifice fly, where you would deliberately hit the ball in the outfield, somebody would catch it, you would be out, but it helps get the runner from third home and allows your team to score a point. The same in basketball. Basketball is a very team-oriented sport. Uh, it's not always the person that scores the basket that uh, makes the biggest contribution. There's also something called assists, which are measured. And that's basically the person who passes the ball to somebody else and enables the team to score a point. Okay, so this is kind of the things that you grow up developing if you're associated with team sports. In China, it's completely different. Now, I admit that that's trending differently today because now the younger people who are growing up, there are more Western influences. Basketball is really popular in China now. So there's a little bit more of team concepts moving into China, but generally for the people that you work with who are over 30 years old, would not have been raised in this type of environment. And this is one where, and this is still true, where you're constantly nagged to study for entrance exams in China. So at each stage, you have to compete against all the other children, pass a certain score or be in the top certain percentage to actually get into a better school or more prestigious school. And all the parents will always tell their children, almost, almost like kind of in a brainwash fashion that if you can't get into a good school, basically you have no opportunities for a good life. So this is kind of their environment and how my counterparts in China were raised. Uh, in America, when we play sports, we're, talk, we're taught sportsmanship. So it's really not whether you win or lose, but it's actually how you play the game. And that's a very big distinction from a lot of examples that I've experienced in China where kids are actually forbidden to play with other children from less connected families. So this is not something that one person has told me in an isolation, but I've met a lot of people who grew up in different parts of China who said that because my family was a certain class status, and, but I just wanted to play with the neighbor's kids or even like the kids of the, you know, the, the maids or the workers in the field, my parents would not allow me. And they would basically say, those kids are from a less connected, poorer family. So we don't want to associate with them. Okay. So that's completely the contrast of having sportsmanship. Uh, growing up in the United States, we're always taught that all people are created equal. But in China, because of, and this goes back to Confucianism and the hierarchical system in China, in China, the leader is always right, okay? And there's really no debate. So depending on your level and the hierarchy, so in the family, it would be the grandfather, and then it may be the father. It's a very male-dominated society in that sense. At a country level, it's obviously... Uh, the premier or the president, but at the company level, it's the CEO and whoever is a higher level than you, they would always be right. And that really doesn't encourage teamwork. And it also doesn't encourage people to uh, think creatively to solve problems. So when we solve problems as part of a team, in America or in Western culture, we like to brainstorm. Okay. But brainstorming is really something that is foreign to most Chinese. Now, obviously Chinese who have spent many years working at multinational companies, they're now accustomed to brainstorming, but uh, based on their mentality, brainstorming is not something that feels natural. And that's because they grew up in an environment where it's basically a command and control hierarchy. So we contrast that if you're working at a Chinese state-owned enterprise, you really don't have to think about what you do. You just have to do what you're told. And your ability to rise up through the ranks is just basically based on the level of guanxi. Uh, obviously, that changes somewhat when you move into uh, just Chinese companies that are privately held. And it moves over even more when you're talking about Chinese who are working for Western companies or multinational companies, and they get exposure to different types of culture. Uh, 
in the United States, we are taught to love thy neighbor. But in China, it's really kind of a guanxi based system. So you will always discover that blood relatives or blood relations, the guanxi from that transcends everything. But that doesn't just mean that uh, you would prioritize giving some opportunity to a relative. This goes all the way to uh, a relative or a blood relative. You know, you cannot actually criticize somebody who is related to somebody else, even if that person is obviously wrong, uh, because the person that you're working with who's related to that person would view that very, very negatively. So you have to just be very, very careful on how you criticize somebody that has a blood relation. And that is also a complete contrast to uh, the environment in which I grew up in the US where um, we may be more critical of somebody who we have a relationship with because we don't want to give the impression of favoritism. And that would be completely opposite of what you probably would experience in China. Uh, one final thing, um, you know, in the United States, even in our constitution, it's a very kind of what we call Christians values based society. Now, uh, obviously the United States has um, many, many different religions. So I don't want to say that all Americans are Christians, but uh, a lot of the values are derived from Christianity. And, uh, and, and that's just basically America as a society is like that. Now in China, it's completely the opposite. China by law is an atheist society. So what we want to do is we just want to understand how that might affect a person's worldview growing up in a Christian culture and growing up in an atheist culture with respects to teamwork and loving thy neighbor and sportsmanship and stuff like that. In China, generally speaking, it doesn't exist. Uh, of course, there are a lot of Christians in China, but we're not going to get into a, a religious discussion here. But I just want to just, just, just talk about in very broad terms why many Chinese view teamwork much differently than we as Americans do. So what are the really the greatest challenges of fostering teamwork in China? It's really patience. Because what you want to do is you want to create a positive teamwork experience, which means this is not something that you say, but it's something that has to be embedded not only in the culture that you're trying to lead, but it has to be embedded in the system of rewards, which is why and how people are incentivized to behave in a certain way. So if you reward individual behavior, individual achievements, and individual KPIs, then that is ultimately what people in China will focus on. Even if you're saying we need to be, uh, we need to work as a team, we need to help each other and all of this. So it really depends on the environment that you foster and the culture that you create, whether you're able to successfully have in the US what we would call team dynamics. And in China, it requires a lot of patience. Okay, so. Again, I'm gonna do a really quick case study, and this is one about dysfunctional teamwork. And again, this is a personal experience of mine uh, where I was in a situation and it was dysfunctional. And we're gonna use this case study to help you illustrate why it was dysfunctional. And hopefully it will help you understand your own relationships and interactions with people in China that you're trying to work with or partner with and why they may behave in a certain way. So I always wanna start with a disclaimer. Uh, the purpose of these case studies is really just to help you with your imagination. Imagination is really how you unlock empathy for people who don't share a similar culture and a similar set of values, okay? So the goal is not to judge people who behave poorly, but is to be empathetic to why they behave the way they behave. Okay, so the background is basically, um, this was after I had left my 
employer when I was the Asia Pacific sales manager in China. And I was basically consulting uh, and trying to do my own thing. And a local Chinese friend, I have a lot of friends in China, but they basically talk to me all the time and they ask for my advice, uh, even in China. And they just think that I have a very unique business perspective and background and how I can break things down unemotionally in a very global, a global context. So one of my local Chinese friends said, now that you are doing your own thing, I want to partner with you to help you get your message out and build a business around that. So the mission was to develop what I call then a cross-cultural performance platform that empowers Chinese people to achieve greater success on a global stage. Okay, so the target was Chinese people. And we wanted to provide training services, coaching services, and host events. We invested money in this enterprise. So it was a 50-50 capital investment. But since I was the content creator, I was the presenter, I was a teacher, I was an instructor, it ended up being a 60-40 kind of equity split because I would presumably be doing most of the work and all of the business would kind of be based around my background. Okay. <clears throat> and the team was basically, I would be the CEO and my wife, who was Chinese, she was basically a passive partner. So she was just an investor. And my friend was also an investor or a private partner. And his spouse would be part of the operation. She would be in charge of marketing. So having a Chinese person doing marketing in China uh, made a lot of sense. What was unknown to me at that time was that my friend's primary motivation was actually to create something to do with his wife, for his wife, something to do. Because his wife, they, they had a son that was about two or three years old. So his wife had not been working for about three years and basically wanted to get back into working and having a career. And he thought, what better way to do that than have her work with somebody like me where we're developing a business together and essentially I could be coaching her full time to develop these kind of Western business marketing uh, management type, uh, type knowledge. Okay. So that is the background. And as far as teamwork goes, here is where the priorities of me and my friend's wife started to diverge. And when you have diverging priorities, when you see in your own partnerships or your own uh, team dynamics, this is where uh, you start to experience a lot of dysfunction. So for me, because my age, uh, when I start a business, it's basically my life. You know, I want to start this business that I started three years ago called EME. I want to do this for the rest of my life. I'm passionate about what I do. And, and I want to make this something that can help a lot of people succeed in a multicultural environment. For her, it was basically, as I said, it was just a piggyback on something that was very unique. So in Shanghai, there was really nobody doing what I was doing, especially at that time when we started doing it. I mean, there's a lot of people who teach English. There's a lot of people who teach business English. Uh, there's a lot of programs that teach management or MBA, but there was really nobody doing what I was doing, which is really helping Chinese people understand the context of doing business in multinational companies and on a global stage. For me, it was obviously a full-time career. I was all in on this business that my wife and I invested money to develop, but for her, she was still kind of a full-time mother. I mean, sometimes she would bring her son into the office and, you know, that was just how our priorities were really not aligned, which ultimately affected the way that we work together. So for me, I was focusing on building a brand. So if I wanted to, to just do like freelance training or, or, or stuff like that, I, would, I didn't need to establish a company. I almost didn't, I wouldn't even need to have a website. I would just need to leverage my connections to try to get training opportunities based on my credentials. Uh, so I was focused on building a brand, uh, EME, as a platform that would actually grow and be valuable over time. 
she was focused basically just on selling services. So whereas I wanted to build a business, she was almost treating me like a freelance trainer that was highly qualified and we should just go out and find a lot of training opportunities. Um, so my investment, my focus would be to invest in marketing. And what ended up happening is she was more interested in kind of the whole uh, face or means of actually working with somebody like me and starting this business with this foreigner. So what ended up happening is we ended up investing, paying a lot of money in our office before we even had anything established. We rented an office at the Shanghai Tower in Lu Jiazhe at the heart of uh, Shanghai's financial district on the 30th floor with the view of Lu Jiazhe Park. And we basically burned through a lot of cash just renting an office that we really didn't need. Um, so from my perspective, because we were equal investors, uh, we were equal partners. And what was different is being equal partners isn't the same as being equal decision makers, right? So we're all equal partners as investors. My wife and my friend were passive investors, so they, didn't, they weren't involved in the operations. I was basically developing everything. I was the CEO. But... Um, in the end, it was how do we make a lot of critical decisions about what our priorities are, okay? So obviously, I needed a Chinese partner for things like WeChat and Youku and YouPay and setting up local business registration and all of the things that you need to do to uh, transact business with Chinese people at that time. But just having a local partner to be able to do that wasn't really enough to make the business endeavor successful. And what ended up happening was it was a very dysfunctional relationship. Uh, I'm very accommodating. So I always want to hear other people's point of view. I always want to discuss all the pros and cons and all the merits of whatever idea we had. But when our priorities are you know, diverging and actually going in opposite directions, it's almost impossible to reach kind of alignment. And it was a very dysfunctional kind of team, even though it was only a team of two people. So what are the real lessons learned and maybe killer tips? So first is um, finding the right partner is what your focus should be. A lot of foreigners go into China and they say, I need a local partner. So they're only evaluating can the local partner do local things that you're unable to do? But just being able to do the tasks in China that you need done because you don't read Chinese or you don't under certain, understand certain things, uh, that doesn't make that person the right partner. So the mindset that you really need to focus on is finding the right partner, which is often different than finding just a local partner. The other thing is, is you really want to align on process. Process is actually more important than the objectives because the objectives, when you're starting a new business, actually almost have no meaning. I mean, you can put together a business plan and you say, these are our short-term goals, these are our long-term goals, this is our five-year sales plan, these are the targets that we want to meet. But those almost have no impact or effect on process, what you do to become successful. Um, and so aligning on process is more important than aligning on objectives. The other thing is uh, the schedule is really important. And what do I mean by that? Uh, time has a very different meaning in a Chinese cultural context than it does, say, in a Western cultural context. And the way that people generally describe that is that uh, Americans, in my case, think in a more linear fashion uh, and, and our thinking is linear. We go from point A to point B and everything progresses in a certain sequential manner. For Chinese, uh, this is why they always characterize Chinese as more circular thinkers. Uh, they basically uh, deal with things in a more emotional level. So the priority is not 
a schedule that you've laid out. We need to do A before we do B. We need to do B before we do C. But it's basically whatever they think and feel is most important in the moment. So when you're partnering or working with somebody like that, it's very difficult because they are just focused on what seems to be most important as, to, as opposed to following the schedule. And this comes fundamentally down to a different cultural concept or cultural value or a cultural perception of time. And that would be linear time versus circular time. And if you've ever been in a relationship or an argument with your wife when or spouse, I don't want to be sexist, but whenever you're in an argument with your spouse, when people are emotional, time basically doesn't matter. So it's at the heightened state of emotions when people are behaving what would be equivalent to more circular reasoning. Okay. So this is kind of the overview of why working as a team or teamwork dynamics is so difficult in China. And the key to, for success is just to really be empathetic to, again, as I said, the environment in which Chinese were, most Chinese were raised, uh, how they may not have the same concept of teamwork as you do. So you don't want to judge that. You want to be very patient with developing a new culture within the team, within the organization. You wanna make sure that if you're involved in HR, that the incentives and the rewards are actually tied to the behaviors that you want, not just the results that you want, okay? So uh, that is the end of the formal presentation. I am gonna stop the share screen. I think I see Albert on the line. So Albert, I'm going to unmute you and you can unmute yourself.